Welcome to the Blue Innovation Dock. This is day six of uh, BOAT 2023, and I'm very ha happy to be here. Um, we, today we were going to cover, I do need to use my glasses, sustainable, sustainable nautical tourism in water sport. So the, the panelists you're going to be seeing on the stage today are not particularly in the, the big boating industry, but all the, uh, the accessories and the smaller boats and the, the, um, the water sports products that are related to the water industry. And we're very curious what their vision of the future is and what their suggestions are. So I will introduce everybody. Um, our first panelist is Jerome Piero. He's the general secretary of the Federation of European Sporting Good Industry from Luxembourg. Welcome to the stage. I just, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Anouk Grun. I'm from Holland, as you can see, because I'm so tall. And um, my background is actually in design. So I've been working for the motorcycle industry and the snowmobile industry, which I also consider industries somehow related to the boating industry. Um, our, next, our next guest will be Thomas Diedrichs. <laughs> Diedrich. From the, uh, he's the president and chairman of the Diving Industry Association. Welcome to the stage. And our guest after that is Tim Ike Krebs. Can you over there? Yeah, wherever you like. Wherever and you I can like. give yourself a glass of water in case you uh, choke. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Tim, he is a chairman of the committee for Federal Canoe Association. And he also has an outdoor adventure business. Yes. So, okay. And, and uh, we also have Otto Dennis. Dennis? Yes. Got to work on my Latvian. <laughs> uh, he is manager and CEO and founder of the Prestel Group. And he's also a former professional canoeist and they, um, the Prestel Group makes um, racing kayaks and canoe for the Olympics. Is this correct, right? Yep. <laughs> and finally, uh, Florian Brumer. He's managing director of Starboard. Welcome to the stage. Um, they Star, Starboard Group makes uh, windsurfers, kite surfers, winging, and stand-up paddles. Yes. So all super cool products. <laughs> um, just, a, just a general question. Does everyone have a stand at the stage or at the, at the show? Yes, we do. Could everyone raise the hand? The, hand? the whole group has what? a stand at the booth. Uh, yes, yes, yes. We are exhibiting. You are not. Oh, OK. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, just go down the line. And if you do have a booth, maybe mention where it is in case people want to mm. visit it. So I think um, we start with you, Florian. If you could just introduce yourself, uh, your company, and, um, and maybe what your first impressions of the show are, if you've been yeah. around at all. Well, so uh, thank you for welcoming me at the, at the booth, at the, uh, at the forum here. Uh, we are distributing uh, windsurfing, kitesurfing, stand-up paddle and wing products. Uh, we are exhibiting at Hall 17. Uh, it's, a, it's a great hall where a lot of action goes on. We have a really big pool there uh, where people can uh, basically try our sports. So, uh, so this is pretty unique that uh, in January you can go stand up paddling. The pool is uh, uh, over 60 meters long and 20 meters wide. We also have daily shows at the pool where people are showing how to wing surf, wing foil and pump foiling. So that's a pretty new sport. Uh, you have a big foil underneath your board and you don't need a, you don't need a wing, you don't need a sail. You know, you just start pumping and, uh, and it uh, gets you going. It, it, you know, then you're more or less flying over the water. And so that's, is that the wing, the wing board? Is that it's, a, it's a wing board. Well, basically the pump boards are smaller than a wing board. 
Um, so you don't need a big platform. It's just uh, that you have a, a nice dance on the on the board, okay. and then uh, you know you start pumping, and then it uh, it keeps you afloat, and then you're basically flying over the water. Wow. And what so could you mention again? Which hall you're at? It's hall 17. Hall 17. So it's uh, just go outside, and it's uh, right on the opposite side. So very easy to find. Cool. All right. And uh, that's something else about you. Um, yeah, because it mentioned you're a professional skier. Ski uh, well, I'm uh, I'm the CEO of the distribution company for Central Europe. Uh, Starbuck Group is, uh, is basically spread all over the world. Uh, so because we do have different brands and different products, so uh, the head office is based uh, close to Bangkok in Thailand. Um, you know, all the uh, the kite stuff is developed uh, in uh, in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, our sail brand, uh, Severn. Uh, the, the brand management uh, and the development R&D team uh, is based in Perth, in Australia. And then, of course, we have uh, worldwide team riders uh, also in Europe, um, which are in, uh, involved in, in R&D. And this is very important so that, uh, you know, all the, uh, all the ideas and, uh, you, know, you know, what you're doing in R&D, uh, you know, is uh, all across the world. So, uh, so that you have the influence of all different markets, because for sure Australia is different, uh, you know, in demand, you know, uh, versus uh, versus Europe. But this is very important that uh, you know everybody is more or less involved to develop the right products. Okay, cool. Okay, um, then Otto, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Otto. I'm from Riga, from Latvia. I'm actually like in, in two in, in one in this uh, conference because I represent the Yacht Club. I own Yacht Club in Riga and also I own factory and we produce uh, 15 years already of professional sport equipment most like, uh, like Olympic racing kayaks uh, in wintertime bobsleds, uh, airplane parts and a lot of uh, stuff from composite and I'm deep in this composite industry as well we start uh, produce uh, standard pedal boards and, and windsurf boards and wing foil boards uh, for many other brands. And, and we have all products, what you can see in, in Hall 17 as well, in, in any many brand uh, stands. So yeah, that's, that's my... So in Hall 17, it's, it's, uh, you have different stands? I don't have a stand, but I have customers who have, oh, have products, <laughs> what we produce for them. That have your products? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then we have um, Tim. Ike, yeah. Ike. Um, yes, we are in hall number uh, 14. And um, on the other side of the big pool also. And um, a lot of action is there going on. And yes, um, my association um, uh, supports um, um, companies and businesses who are in the um, canoe tourist um, yeah, um, industry. And um, yeah, we do a lot of uh, political work. Um, so, and also we give orientation for customers where they find um, high quality businesses and also sustainable businesses. Um, and we give orientation. Um, and uh, what, what infrastructure, uh, infrastructure is needed um, to uh, help sustainability tourism. Um, then um, we certify businesses. Um, um, so um, we, we check the materials uh, and the equipment. We um, check um, how they're doing the work. And so, um, yeah, and so we, we're doing a lot of things on this political stuff, and, yeah. And how many members do you have in the um, association? Around, f so the, the, the 50 biggest um, tourism uh, businesses in this canoe business, yes. So yes. around 50, and we have also 50. For for Europe or just Germany? Just Germany. Okay, just and okay, yeah, and say, that's not we also <laughs> have some um, producers and importers. Okay. Yes. And a lot of them are here today, I suppose. Or some of them, yes. Okay. Not all, but some. Yes. Yeah, I like the folding uh, the folding kayaks. Yeah, um, some of them are members, some are not. Yeah. Okay. But we try to, to get them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. 
Okay, uh, thank you. And then we have Thomas, who is um, the president and chairman of the Diving Association. Um, could you tell a little bit about your background? Yeah, yeah. L let me start and thank you for being here. Uh, so our sport is taking place underwater and uh, it seems as I be the right person in that because my mother told me I was able to swim before I was able to walk. <laughs> uh, now you can say I may have been lazy to walk very o as, a, as an older child. However, I love water and uh, being active in the water. So I'm here on the board on the channel as the uh, president of the uh, German Diving Association. Uh, which finally, keep in mind, diving is a smaller, a smaller sports sport in that market. So you find worldwide around uh, 50 manufacturers which are represented in there as an industrial association. You find diving in hall 13, but it's easy to find. As soon as you get into a crowdy spot, you are in the diving hall because it drives a lot of interest. Uh, there is a pool to see some activities. And uh, you need to keep in mind the divers are the group who sees the environmental impacts immediate. So the, lif the life underwater is what we see and what we report, and that is for us so important to get into a sustainable uh, way of doing our sport because uh, uh, just uh, our global goal, 1.5 degree warming, we will stop it there, will kill more or less all coral reefs already. And that is where we do our sport. In my uh, real life, I am uh, the owner and CEO of a company producing and distributing diving equipment in the whole world. So designing, distributing, and you will find us as well in uh, 12, so Hall 12 diving uh, there at the booth E22. And what, what's the name of that brand? It's OMS, Ocean Management Systems. Okay. I can tell you, I can get you a complete story on that, but that is not what we are talking and about today. You can give today. me a free outfit and everything? Yeah, yeah free not, but uh, <laughs> let's say an outfit working very well for okay. getting underwater. All right, thank you. And then finally, Jerome, he's uh, Secretary General of the European uh, Sporting Goods Industry. So I guess all these people would be interesting to be uh, members, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Um, so yeah, please tell us about you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be amongst such fine panelists. Um, so my name is Jérôme Perrault. I'm the Secretary General of FASI, which is the Federation of the European Sporting Goods Industry. It's basically a trade federation based in Brussels, representing the interest of the sporting goods in industry. And when I say sporting goods industry, it's mainly sports brands, Nike, Adidas, Puma, North Face, Patagonia, but also uh, sports manufacturers, uh, sporting goods retailers like Intersport, for example. So um, it's quite a big federation. Um, our role is to monitor all the legislative developments uh, that are happening in Brussels. As you may know, 75 to 80 percent of national legislation, whether on products or uh, you know uh, anything else, originate from Brussels and then get implemented into national laws. So that's why it's very important for us to be involved in this. So we monitor the developments that are of interest to our members. We take part in it. We are a part of many expert groups. Myself, for example, I'm part of an expert group uh, made of the European Commission. Um, which is called Green Sports, so I think very much in line with the discussion we're having today, where we're talking also about sports competitions and how to make them greener and more sustainable. So, you know, there's the element of uh, sports equipment, sports footwear, sports clothing, and some of those, I mean, a lot of those products are also used in, in, in water sports, uh, generally, uh, whether on boats or underwater, uh, scuba diving, etc., etc. We have around, indirectly, we have around 2,000 members, uh, but directly we have around 100 members that are directly members of FASI. That's, that's it. I'm from Luxembourg, but I'm based <laughs> in Brussels. Okay, based in Brussels. And that's because, you, because you're part of the, um, when, it, when new products come into Europe, your organization needs to check if they are viable for this for the European market or well that's or more the national market enforcement authorities that take care of okay. um, compliance from a custom standpoint or a trade standpoint uh, what we do is really to 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 represent the interest of the sporting goods industry with the decision makers the policy makers and uh, and inform the industry as much as we can to make sure that they are complying with 
new consumer expectations, policy expectations that are coming of over the next five or ten years. Okay. Mm. All right. Thank you so much. <coughs> um, I think we'll, we uh, <laughs> we we go back again to Florian. <laughs> The question for you, <laughs> so now we'll get to the sustainability. Um, what are some uh, sustainable innovations you are incorporating in your water sports product? You just showed me something amazing. And how do you encourage people to get out on the water and appreciate all the natural clean environment has to offer? Well, first of all, I think you know, we have to be honest because uh, uh, you know, we are producing plastic. All of our products are made out of plastic, more or less. So, uh, of course, you know, we are leaving a footprint. But we have to, to try to reduce this footprint as much as, 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 much as possible. And uh, so, uh, you know, within our R&D, we are trying to, uh, to use as many or as the least amount of virgin products. So uh, this means, uh, you know, for example, I, I brought an example with me because this is like, uh, like brand new. Um, you have to imagine that uh, you know, worldwide industry is using uh, 100,000, 105,000 tons of carbon. So uh, um, you know, so this is uh, you know also for airplanes That's and everything. That's including all industries. But you know, the sports industry alone is using about 15,000 tons of carbon. So we have a lot of products in, you know made out of carbon. Uh, so, for example, like moss for the for the sails. Uh, now we have the foils. Also, the the moss for the foils are made out of uh, carbon. And of course, a moss can break. So because it, it you know once it's aging, so then the moss is breaking. And uh, you know we found uh, a partnership with a company, and they are able to uh, to recycle carbon. And this fin, well, this is basically a fin which is underneath the board like this. Um, for for a stand-up pedal board, and, uh, and the fin is made out of uh, out of recycled carbon, and this is basically like the first product you know we make we make out of uh, recycled carbon. So you know all of our boards have like a like a, a EVA deck, and all the EVA we are using is recycled EVA. So as said, you know we are trying to use the least amount of virgin materials. So uh, all the Could boards. Could you just are say what what is EVA? EVA is uh, is uh, you know like a, a soft material. Like um, rubber? You know, is so it like a rubber? It's more convenient to stand on the board, you know, with the with the EVA. Like a traction. The EVA deck. It's it's a uh, it's like a deck pad. Okay. So like a carpet on the floor. But so but what's it made of? What is the? Um, like a, it's also it type of plastic. Ethyl vinyl acetate. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? This is a plastic type of plastic. Okay. Ethyl vinyl acetate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so this is this is one thing that we are, as said, you know, we are using um, the least amount of virgin materials, uh, using uh, bioresin, uh, trying to avoid uh, glue wherever we can. Uh, but this is only one part. So this is the part in you know in uh, producing the the products. Uh, but beside this, um, and this is you know everybody is welcome to visit uh, our our uh, website, uh, blue dot starboard dash. Uh, board.com, uh, where we show what we are doing in uh, in sustainability, in you know being uh, you know eco-friendly, so to say. Uh, so uh, one important thing is uh, uh, we have uh, we have a partnership with uh, in Thailand with an um, organization called Trash Heroes, and these people are collecting trash from the beaches. So far, we, we started in 2017, and so far these people collected. Uh, um, 460,000 kilos of uh, trash from the beaches in Thailand. <coughs> and the trash they collect, like PET bottles, are recycled. Uh, you know, aluminum will be recycled. So all the trash, you know, will be separated. And uh, as, as, as much uh, as we can will be recycled. And uh, then, you know, in, a, in an upcycling process, being uh, new materials built. So this is one important issue. The other issue is, uh, is education. And this is for me one of the most important uh, points is that we are educating the kids, you know, how to how to treat the environment. And uh, you know, of course, we see um, you know like uh, um, a lot of uh, protests going on, um, you know, in all over the world. Um, so, but uh, you know, so we have a cooperation with World Sailing, um, as we are also. Uh, 
you know, the uh, Olympic class for Olympic windsurfing. And uh, so we just released this workbook for kids so they can draw in this book and, uh, and learn how to, how to uh, uh, treat the environment, you know, especially to keep the oceans clean. Um, and uh, uh, Thomas can see, see it from underneath. We only can see it from the top, what's going on. And sometimes when you go windsurfing or kiting, you know, you can see a lot of trash in the water. So we have to collect the trash number one, but we also have to avoid that people are just dumping their trash. And this is a part of, uh, of the uh, uh, education for kids. Yeah. So that's very important. And is, is that book available if anyone here has kids at your stand? Or so it's, uh, it's like the first sample. Okay. Um, I, just, I just got it before the show. Yeah. But this is what we will, uh, will distribute with our partners, like retailers, like uh, windsurfing centers, kite centers, so that uh, you know, when the kids are getting in touch with our sports, so that they can, that they can learn from this yeah. book. That's a fantastic idea, yeah. Thank you. OK. Um, then we'll go to Otto. Your question is, uh, what are the innovations coming from, um, that you're coming from competitive water sports that can be incorporated into wider leisure ac applications? So more like if, if you are already incorporating, uh, what are you already incorporating? And could, w could we use it also for other uh, sports products? I once said that uh, this technology is already is uh, more or less the same, but uh, I want to continue your previous uh, question more to explain this question also. Uh, as he said about this uh, fin, for example, how to recycle. Uh, can I borrow this? Yeah, one? yeah. <laughs> for example, like he said, you bor uh, recycle carbon fiber. This is a little bit lies because you cannot recycle carbon fiber. It's impossible. You can, uh, for example, burn this out and you get clean carbon fiber again, and, but you burn resin and you create CO2. And that's not good for nature. So that the solution is, and I think this is the solution what do this company, they can change resin from epoxy polyester to thermoplastic. And then you can this, uh, make like a crash and make a chops and, and thermoform something else, like a phone case or something that, like that. And then this is this recycling process. But the most important is in uh, all these uh, products, uh, first of all, how to produce. Because in reality, the problem are not that product. The problem is process, how we produce. And normally, in like uh, everyday production system, what we do, and almost all brands do, we create from part weight, 60% is uh, <laughs> waste from production. And that's the most important, okay, so how to ma make production more efficient, more eco-friendly, and use more efficient materials. And this is something that uh, don't see like an uh, everyday user for board. So even before the end product, yeah, of course. in the that's production the most process. Important. That's the most, most important question. Yeah. And the problem at this moment, everyone, everybody wants cheap and light composite part. And cheap and light means super and efficient and super non-eco-friendly. That's the reality. Yeah. And also, when you produce, uh, like uh, all brands do, they make a big orders in big factories uh, in the beginning of year, and then they get in warehouse, and then they try to sell. And then there's leftovers end of the year. And then these leftovers as well is garbage, because they do new models, and they start the same process again. And then my, I think that the solution is uh, production based by demand. So find a system how to make production based to demand, so customer can make online order in January or February and receive board, and they don't need to keep stock. Yeah. So, so patience, to make patience, less production, actually, of course, it's not good for business, so maybe for factories, but it's only only solution. Yeah. Hmm. And are you also? Can you? Do you have any influence on the production in the factories? Can you? Do you influence? Can you like say, look, we need to make less waste during this production? This process? is what we do every day. What you're doing? We make a bigger search at technical university to find out the, what is the, the best eco-friendly technology. So of course, uh, we know what is the best technology for eco, yeah. but this is long-term technology. We cannot make every year new models to, and use this technology. It's too expensive. So that's, that's the how the first need to change thinking in market, how you buy product. After that, Brands need to change and start offer these solutions. And then factories, of course, uh, the big fact for big factories, this is, uh, this is not good signs, like a signal, because they cannot uh, 
keep this uh, production amount like it is now. They need to produce less. And do you think the only way to really get that to change is European legislation, that, they're, that they say you can only make so much waste in production, or do you really think it's the First manufacturing? First, we need to start talk about this. Because this, if you go to any factory and you see in background, under factory, how big is the vacuum bag, garbage or pipes or resin, if you make this part, this part, I don't know, maybe weights 200 grams. But leftovers is the same resin, but you put in garbage. Yeah. If you don't use some uh, vacuum RTM systems or something like that, with, but uh, technically, this is reality. Yeah. You cut ca from carbon fiber out this piece, and then there is square what is leftover. Yeah, although that, this. that did come from a product that was going to be thrown away, so it's... Yeah. <laughs> we do a lot of Not products as bad. from <laughs> leftovers and from this, uh, yeah. from this material, what yeah. we can use somehow. Yeah. But still, yeah. this is the main problem in industry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of depressing. Anyway, thank you. That's uh <laughs> so. Um, let's go to the next question, and we will get back to maybe solving that problem. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible. Um, yes, Hike. I said last time I called you Tim. I don't know why. Because uh, no problem. <laughs> I'm flexible. <laughs> Um, yeah, so your question is, what are some sustainable innovations you see happening in the canoe sector, since that is your expertise? Um, yes, I, first of all, I think it's a quite sustainable activity. You have no emissions, you have, uh, your engines are here and here, and uh, so... Amazing of, But of course, we can look at some topics, and we can, I think, divide it in three parts. Um, First, of course, as Flo said, and auto um, equipment, materials, um, and objects in some way. Um, and yeah, and, the, and when I go over the exhibition, it's really exciting to see new products and um, new materials. And um, we see in the last years there's a lot of work um, in this direction. But I, what I like to focus on is. Um, the um, on long lasting products. Um, so I think uh, Flo can say something about it, but during Corona, we saw a lot of people buying inflatable subs, inflatable uh, canoes, foldable canoes. And I'm not really sure if this is a correct and the best solution because um, I'm in my business, I'm really much at the water. And yeah, in theory, um, people are thinking, oh, okay, now I take uh, my canoe out of the luggage and then I go by train to the water. And in practice, they're going by car. Um, so um, yeah, and so then I, yeah, and we need to improve production processes. Uh, but um, I also think um, some people need to think about do I really need this product? Or is it better to rent this product? When, and I want to focus on the usage time, the total usage time. It's like um, every, it, this is the most famous uh, example. Um, every, I don't know, every second um, um, family or house has a drilling machine. And what is the usage time of it? It's like uh, 10 minutes. And so, um, and you have to see, of course, um, there are, um, in, f in this fabrication process, of course, this, we talk about um, carbon and emissions. Uh, I think also we need to think about virtual water. Um, so when you want to buy or when you want to build something out of plastic, out of uh, gum, or, yeah, of course, uh, you need water. And this is what we all are living uh, <laughs> for. And, yeah, and so um, I think the, the future is, um, yeah, this um, sharing is caring. Huh? So, um, and this, um, this is what I think is uh, um, also a way of innovation to think this in a new way. 
And yeah, so this is, uh, so we can see there are new issues coming up. But I think on the other hand, we need, um, when we think about this tourism part, um, we need to think about infrastructure. And we need to think about the correct behavior, Flo said it. Uh, we need to inform people. We need to educate people how to behave in nature. It's a sensitive area. Um, and we, um, and so this is what, yeah, my uh, association is, uh, what is the main interest to make it when a minority behaves wrong on the water, the majority will suffer. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, but um, of course, um, you have to, um, you need communicators. Uh, so, um, tourist uh, businesses need to um, give uh, information to customers, and they need also, maybe if a bachelor party is asking, uh, we let's go uh, to a canoe tour uh, at the water and uh, drink alcohol and have, you have to say no. So when you have a long-term thinking, um, you have to say, no, this is not the correct way um, for, um, for nature and for canoeing industry. And I like what you said about that, you know, because before everybody was like, oh, that's amazing, the folding and the inflatable, but that, it, that it's actually uh, a compromise because one that's not foldable is, of course, better. So you should share it and maybe rent it rather. I think we yeah. shouldn't mix things up. Um, so objects are objects yeah. and actions are actions. Yeah. And um, you cannot buy a product and think you did something sustainable. Yeah. This is this is this is wrong. So uh, I think you you can buy a product and then you have to think how do I want to use it? Do I really want to use it that it's um, for me a reason to buy it, or is it just for trying it, yeah. or something like this? And so, um, yeah, and of course, if you want to have sustainable tourism on the water, yeah, and as I said, uh, you, they're going, many people are going by car, and so you can improve this. You can, um, especially in rural areas, you have to um, improve public transportation. Yeah. So if you don't have a good public transport in rural areas, there's no other chance to g than going by car. Yeah. And so this is one thing. So it's uh, also infrastructure in general that, that is influenced. Of course, of course. It's yes. Just in the previous session, that because you mentioned it, um, they were saying that the average boat, which is uh, being docked, uh, is only used 50 hours a year which is also kind of, you know, then you would think, why would anybody buy? I mean, of course, ev you have the money, but why would you then buy it, uh, share it, or, you know, so. Yeah, and it could another be said, a no, um, yeah, maybe you, you saw it at, in Corona, in Aldi and Lidl, there are la one layer subs, and um, yeah. yeah, I don't know how long you yeah. can use it, but I think one season. Yeah. One inflatable board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one inflatable. Before they load it. Okay, that's, yeah. that's a good so one. Using a lot and of okay, yeah. let's, uh, <laughs> let's move what on. What makes me sad sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my next question is for the diving expert. <laughs> uh, so yeah, divers, as we, we talked about earlier, divers rely on boats to bring their customers t back and forth to the diving spots. So do you see that divers are preferring uh, alternative powers like electric or uh, or other fuels, d are they pushing for that, or what is your okay. idea on it's that? Uh, the, the final the final saying is is more correct. So, what we see over last five years is especially the diver is already very sensitive about what he sees, what the diver sees underwater on the development. Returning to a reef, and you could you could have in mind. You did see a reef, a colorful, a coral reef, colorful fishes, and you return after a while and it's just gray stone. And that gray stone is just based on it gets too warm and the uh, warming kills the reef. The reef can't survive. So the divers are 
uh, more sensitive. And what I like to do is, in general, uh, we need to structureize all our sport activities in different sections. We spoke a lot now about manufacturing. That's one segment. But in the end, it's much more than just manufacturing something. It's the activity you do. So the activity you do, we do have customers requesting themselves, am I in the right sport if I am traveling down to the Philippines? But I'm traveling down to the Philippines because there I can see certain, uh, uh, certain creators underwater or certain uh, living room underwater. So they, they are asking themselves the question, am I going there? How do I get out from the shore to the dive site? So first is, uh, again, equipment, manufacturing, activity. And then in that activity, can I do the activity different? Or how can I improve my carbon dioxide, dioxide footprint in total? So do you feel divers are thinking divers about are, that uh, right now? Divers are thinking very much in front of that. Okay. So uh, yes, you're right. A diver would like to have a boat, an electric powered boat, getting them out, out to a dive site. It sounds easy, but it's not as easy as it sounds, because keep in mind, you are in Egypt. Uh, the electric power there is made by diesel power generators. Uh, so even if you now change to an, uh, to an electric powered boat, it doesn't do any substantial because in the end, uh, it's even less efficient first to produce uh, electric power by a diesel generator and then storing that electric power into a battery and then using it for propulsion. So the, the general thing is much more complicated uh, but the divers are the most sensitive part in the water sport area, seeing the outcome and saying we need to work at that, we need to reduce it. Again, uh, you start with small things, so at our booth we show an, uh, a camper. Uh, a camper with a dive center, which, may, which means it's a different way if I am instead of flying maybe down to Egypt or South Africa or Philippines or Thailand, it doesn't matter, I may, I may take my, my group of divers and we travel down to the Mediterranean. The footprint on using a camper is significant lower, even you don't need a hotel. So this drives a lot of interest of people saying, oh wow, this is how I can, make my, I can have my sport still being more sustainable than if I am doing it in the previous way. So people are thinking, we as an industry, we need to point out we have to do. And actually, I think, I'm answering your question, divers are interested, but again, uh, it doesn't make sense to produce energy, uh, electric energy by a diesel generator, especially in a country like Egypt, where the sun is shining for sure every day for 12 hours, uh, maybe uh, maybe 10 hours, uh, there but are different you, ways to do would that. Would you think, let's say uh, you, you, you go to Egypt, you say, I will come and, you know, use your, your, uh, your diving site if you can, you know, have a, have a boat on solar power or, have a, or bring me there with a sailboat or could you ask that as, as a we, customer? Oh, customers are starting to ask yeah. and choose their destination based on what they can offer. Yeah. We, we do see, and, and you know, it's, I, I wouldn't call it greenwashing, you see, Resorts far away, far away, Indonesia somewhere, they truly, they do truly have a zero carbon dioxide footprint okay. and they prove it. So they prove it means they do not have electric power and they are not producing it by diesel. Yes. Uh, they truly use what they have and okay. actually this is a big trend where a customer says I will rather go there than going to the traditional side. So yeah. customers are powerful. Yeah. Uh, customers are the most people are, from, yeah. are the people able to drive industries, and this is now tourism, into a direction. Yeah. Uh, so of course, yeah, and probably, like you say, the the divers are the ones that firsthand no. see the coral changing or dying. So they. It's must, with you. Yeah. So we we see all the all, all the trash, we see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you come to a very nice side, and you say, okay. This looks really, really different. Yeah. And now it is an important understanding what divers are, where divers are seeing themselves. They are the eyes of the population yeah. to tell there is two thirds of our earth is covered by water. 
and only a small group is telling you what's going on underwater. And any, anything, an, any single plastic bottle we put into the water, we will see somewhere in pieces as a fully item, what we will see. Yeah. Uh, we even eat it finally, so in, in our circle. Yeah. yeah, very good, yeah. Okay, so Jerome, your question. Um, what is the pathway towards sustainability of the sporting good industry and what are the key milestones? So I guess this is more in general what you have been seeing going on. <coughs> well, I think, you know, our, our industry, our members, uh, our organization for the last 10 years has been working jointly with policymakers um, to understand um, how we can accelerate the transformation of our industry into a more sustainable industry. Um, so they already started 10 years ago? They started, they started a long time ago, um, but now things are starting to accelerate at numerous levels. Um, we were talking about consumers, unfortunately, it is very important. They are part of the problem and the solution. However, they can't be it alone because we also need now legislation to come into place with you know, mandatory targets and things like that. At, at least that's what the EU believes. And this is why we work together with them. It's, it's a marathon. It's not a race. Um, there are so many things to tackle. And the journey is very long and very complicated because you can with the best intentions in the world, uh, often we say uh, hell is paved with good intentions, um, you, can, you can actually create unforeseen consequences uh, often. And, um, you know, you have to look, so we represent the sports industry, and so you have to look at the entire life cycle assessment of a product, from conception to production, to transport, to the use phase, where you, of course, have to, to engage the, the, the customer, but then also to the waste uh, phase, where, you know, uh, the EU will really try to support and push for circular business models. So, you know, the linear economy is about to, to, to die. You know, the, f the fact that you could uh, buy a product, use it, and then throw it away, this is over. Um, uh, there are so many legislations being prepared right now at the European Commission level. Uh, we talked about greenwashing, so this will be tackled. There's the initiative in March coming out, which is called um, Substantiating Green Claims. So you will need to really substantiate scientifically how you make green claims. If you say <laughs> my, my boat or my, my, my footwear or my swimming products are more sustainable or more green or more durable, etc., you will have to prove it by using various methodologies, product environmental footprinting, for example, things like that. Until now, there has been a lot of goodwill from the industry, from the consumers, and I think that policymakers have you know, let, tried to let the economic game play um, but it's, it's, it's time now that they step in um, because, because, because many things are not, are not advancing. It's the Wild West. You have hundreds of certificates, certifications, labels that are sometimes contradicting each other, that are confusing cons consumers. You have green labels all over the place. You know, you have really self-certificates, voluntary initiatives, um, various methods that you cannot even compare one to another. And so, um, you know, you have companies saying, my T-shirt is conscious, whatever that means. Uh, my, you know, and, and this is really what um, policymakers want to stop. You will need now to, to be able to prove um, your impact during the entire life cycle of a product. So echo design, how you're echo designing it, green claims, you will need to put on official labels with A to G, a little bit like the Nutri-Score or things like that. So more and more, the consumer will be aware of his or her impact with the purchasing behavior, but also the use phase, because we will also need, of course, to, to organize campaigns, to, to educate them, and so on. But the industry really needs to change from, from scratch. The entire business model uh, needs to change. So, so let's, say, let's say you can get that certificate you know, for, that you're talking about. But, um, but what if you don't want to get it? Will you, will you then be penalized? Will you then have to pay like extra green tax? Or is there something like that in the pipeline that you know of from your position? Yes, there are many other initiatives coming up. The eco design regulation, uh, the digital product passport. And at some point, it will no longer be, I don't want to. You will have to. Whether you like it or not, the legislation mm. is coming. And Otherwise, it will your become product mandatory. doesn't come to market. 
Sorry? And then otherwise your product won't come to market. Exactly. And here we're talking about the environmental aspect, but then you also have the whole social aspect that's being developed. You have the forced labor regulation coming up, the um, uh, due diligence uh, directive coming up. So all of the, in the Green Deal, all of the aspects of the life of a product from design to waste will be legislated. And, and what is kind of the timeline? Like, let's say there's now people here in the audience that are starting to have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> what is the timeline well, <coughs> for I when mean, you need it, to, like... It, uh, it's coming very quickly. So most of the, the legislation I'm talking about, and there are around 16, at least for our sector, there are 16 legislations we're working on currently from chemicals to materials to microplastics, for example. We did n <laughs> you, you talk about waste we see in the oceans, but there's also waste we can't see. Right. And that's microplastics and nanoplastics, so that's, that's also coming. Um, all of this legislation uh, is coming now between 24 and 25. Okay. Of course, uh, you will need transition periods, implementation times. They will have to be translated into national laws. So I would expect all of these legislations to be in force around 26, 27. Okay. So it's, it's time to prepare. Yeah. <laughs> the train has yeah. passed, yeah. And are, are you guys the ones that are producing, are you aware of this? That, are, yes. And you're, mm. you have an idea of how you're going to deal with it? Yeah. Maybe you can give a little bit well, of a... You know, in this regard, I would like to get back to what Ike said before. Like, uh, the most power does have the consumer. So they basically decide. And uh, so this is the reason why we start, you know, with, you know, teaching and, and uh, teaching kids, you know, and, and uh, create some uh, consciousness uh, about the, the products. And also what Otto said before is, uh, um, you know, once you, once you develop products uh, uh, where you can see more, uh, uh, which are, you know, kind of more eco-friendly, it's more expensive. And, uh, and this is, you know, again, so then the consumer decides, well, you know, would I like to get something more expensive or less expensive? Uh, you know, just an example, because, you know, we have been talking about uh, uh, SUPs, uh, inflatable SUPs. Um, for example, Let me just you know, one e explain. SUP is a stand-up paddle. Stand-up right? paddleboard, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of uh, inflatable stand-up uh, paddleboards in the market. And uh, like the cheap products, you know, they're all made with glue. And uh, one paddleboard is, you know, you need approximately one kilo of glue. So, you know, when there is like a discount store having like 100,000 produced, you know, we're talking about 100,000 of kilos of glue. But, you know, they're sold cheap. But, you know, when you, when you have uh, different technologies, which are more, uh, more important, uh, more ex uh, expensive, so then, uh, you know, you also have to, that product is more expensive. And, uh, and this is what, uh, what uh, you know, all the, the, the R&D guys are doing. So looking for a way how to be more eco-friendly, you know, in development and production. But of course, you know, it's more expensive. So, so, so there is a way to like seal an inflatable yes. SUP so it's a, without it's a glue? It's, you know, you can reduce the glue by laminating, like uh, welding. Like, like welding together, yeah, melt like welding. together plastic. Yeah. So when you weld and, and laminate, you don't have to use glue. So and you're it, saving, it, you're saving one better? kilo of glue per board. Does it look nicer too? Once again? Does it look nicer? <laughs> you, 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 you can't see a difference. Can't see it. Okay. <laughs> it even looks nicer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Otto, are you, have you, do you do the welding as well? No, or? that's not our type of business, okay. the inflatable board. It's <laughs> uh, another story. Okay. We do composite, uh, like a hard board, plastic, car carbon fiber, fiberglass. Yeah. Okay. But just a question, so if you, if you would use a bucket of glue for each of those, what, when it, so that glue will go to, into the environment at the end of life, or does it also start to go into the water while you're using it? Like if you would... No, it, it's, not, it's not getting into the okay. water. So it's end but of life, you will have... You know, so then, you know, for example, when you, when you weld a board, uh, it has, uh, it has a, you know, a longer life cycle. Yeah. So that's very important. So, yeah. you know, this is like a, a major step in sustainability, yeah. you know, to, to, uh, to extend the life cycle of products, of you know, board. to be used, yeah. you know, longer. I mean, you know, when an inflatable, you know, is leaking, 
uh, you know, on the, at the seams because uh, the glue is not good anymore. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, basically you have to throw it away. Throw it away and it's, yeah. you know, to, re to recycle inflatable board is really, really complicated. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so this is what we have to be aware of. And, uh, you know, in composite boards, so what Otto is doing in his production, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easier to recycle and upcycle these materials. And uh, so this is, but this is a constant uh, process, you know, we have to work on to see, you know, how, can, how we are able to recycle and, uh, and upcycle, uh, you know, goods we are producing. And Otto, just th um, what kind of materials are you using for the, the, um, the hard boards? It, do, are you looking also into alternatives or? No, oh, it's uh, also a complicated question because the Composite material means that this is material from many materials together. For example, in this fin again, there is a, there's a carbon fiber, one material what we can see, this fiber. Then there is a resin, what creates stiffness. And then there's inside core, like a foam material, a wood material, but it's third material. And when you want to recycle this, all these materials is glued together with this resin. And the problem most is this resin. It separates from this resin. Yeah. And if you start to heat up this burn, in fire, then you get again clear carbon fiber, but you burn resin and you burn core. So that's great, like a chemical smoke. Yeah. And this is the like a biggest problem in composite industry. Yeah. How to separate this composite material again in uh, like a so so start so level. Uh, if so then you, what you're saying is it's better to keep the material pure and not do so much well, mixing. At this moment, the easiest and cheapest way is just crush this like in, in chips, and then from the chips you can do something. Yeah. Yeah. Add to concrete, add to asphalt, add to mix again with resin, and then press something. This is, this is the way. But after that, there is no option how to recycle. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's the, again, is, Are you the seeing any of this happening in the canoe production as well or, or mm. <coughs> yes I think um, you, have, you have to dis decide um, I think of course uh, you can use um, also I think also cradle to cradle uh, materials in some way so that they really um, are recyclable or maybe also compostable. You can make, of, of course, uh, canoes out of wood. Um, so, but of course, you have to paint it a little bit. Yeah. But um, yeah, at the end, um, it's a, it's the same question: How long can you use it, um, and what are the real costs? Um, so, and we have to, and sometimes maybe you have to find a compromise. Um, maybe the production process is, uh, could be more innovative and more sustainable. Uh, sustainable. But um, when, and then you have to look at the usage, usage time. For in, in our company or in my business, we have boats we bought over 20 years ago. And they are, we, we care them about them and we are repairing them and um, but they are also in a good, um, yeah, they're all, they're really good. Good shape. Good shape, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, has, <coughs> has a lot of the design changed on the canoe, or is it like the one from 20 years ago is not? Not really. Okay. But when I think, I don't, I don't know what was t 20 years ago, I was really young. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't think that they made so many thoughts about this, yeah. but... I think when I'm looking at the usage time, and I think um, I rented them many, many, many thousands of times, um, the uh, footprint of this product is good. Is, yeah, so. because it's lasted for so long. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, so sometimes, and, and when I hear, um, okay, this boat is. Uh, recyclable, compostable. Sometimes when I look at some boats, I'm just asking myself, okay, when will it break? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> three years, five years, f uh, so. Yeah. And it's, yeah, this is what, what these products sometimes suggest a yeah. little bit. So that actually, that uh, then you make a really good point that the right to repair, you know, that, that uh, yeah. if you do produce a product, 
yeah. do you do you then to tell your clients you can come back and we will repair it for you for not an exorbitant amount, like not for more than the boat actually cost or the yeah. or the product. And I yeah, here I don't know what the um, but the uh, green deal says about bo this boat thing. Uh, but of course, the right to repair yeah. is also relevant for uh, the boating or for the canoe industry. Yeah. We yeah we have in uh, SVP uh, you have this repair kits and. Um, this works quite well. I just two weeks ago just I repaired uh, one. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask: Is it, is the right to repair? Is that also something you've seen coming by that will be a legislation? Or yeah, <coughs> definitely. Um, so the legislations I was referring to for the time being are overarching. So they're sector agnostic, so to say. They will cover all sectors, and then uh, the EU will start working on sector specific criteria, guidelines, things like that for the textile industry or for uh, water sports industry, etc., uh, machinery, cars, whatever. But there is an initiative called the Right to Repair Initiative. <laughs> so so you, there you go already. Uh, and this is definitely going to be used to incentivize circular business models, reuse, secondhand, repairability, refurbishing, and there are going to be tax incentives and uh, you know echo bonuses for companies and brands and so on, or, or services providers that do these services. Uh, and that's to encourage not them. even for the the water sports industry. That's for all. For that's all for everything. Right? But then definitely there will be guidelines and criteria. Yeah for s specific the sectors. Industries. We have, yeah. um, I mean, exactly like everything that was discussed now, we have exactly the same issue with the winter sports industry. So the ski, uh, ski boots, I mean, it's very similar materials. And you have to look at in, in different ways. I mean, if you do your life cycle assessment of your product and your carbon footprint, it's not always there where you think it will be. Of course, you can do, you know, you can design them so that they can be easier to take apart and to recycle, but that will take time. You have to raise the bar within an entire industry. In the meantime, you need to recycle or to repair or to, uh, you know, upcycle or downcycle products that have been in the, in the market for 20, 30 years or 10 years, and they might have substances that are now forbidden, so you cannot recycle them anymore. Uh, they so you have to, to, to go through very complicated processes that might even have a very negative environmental impact because you need machines to shred them, to separate them, or you have to recycle them through chemicals that are not really you know, <laughs> good for the environment. So you have to do all these trade-offs when you calculate the life cycle of a product. And, you know, we are, we are as an industry in the middle of that with the winter sports industry. How to calculate, how to measure, how to make sure we can compare. We have the um, a, a sector-specific um, test method or methodology to calculate all of this. And then how to make them, you know, uh, more recyclable by design, uh, but also how to invest and foster into more circular business models such as renting, leasing. Uh, I mean, the ski industry is already renting a lot, but to even uh, improve this. Yeah. And what about in the diving industry? So we're going to wrap up this for the last, uh, but what, anything um, like the, can you, how long will, it, will a suit last and can you then reuse it or... What is the Keep in mind it's uh, performance-based equipment. So performance-based equipment is typically designed on the high levels. So ultrasonic welding is something which already took place in diving when nobody were thinking about it in other industries. However, it's a good question. Uh, a, a, a suit itself will age. So let's say a suit keeping you warm underwater, which you know as a neoprene suit, it will age. Uh, luckily, it's maybe uh, not a composite material, it's so it's relatively easy to recycle. Uh, but it's, it's correct what you said. On that cycle, you need to look at uh, the whole lifetime, including uh, uh, wasting it or recycling it. So performance-based equipment uh, is repairable, no question. It even needs to have maintenance uh, to keep performance. So, uh, I in my eyes, the diving industry is at the forefront, but as you said, and you said very, very much the truth, the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that details, you may run up and suddenly realize, oh, wow, I never thought about that. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, we, will, we, will find, we will find a situation where most of it is, is forced by law, 
and it seems to be needed to force by law because our traditionally business model, which means uh, uh, price competition, demand, will do it, it will not. Uh, I can still produce it cheaper, and if I can produce cheaper, it will still be in the market as a competitive product. But if, if, uh, if your product is produced cheaper, but it's not allowed on the market, then... No, no, it's correct. I, I know, but that's more like that would be a, a solution for yeah, yeah, it's the, uh, the cheaper, you know, to, to how, to, how to avoid um, a cheaper, less sustainable product, just it won't be available, or... Uh, or maybe people are going to fly to Australia to find that, or I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, this is, I have to say, all the, so the talks that I've seen so far, they've all been slightly depressing, um, but also <laughs> hopeful at the same time, um, because, you know, we're not sitting here for nothing. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your insights, and I wish you lots of luck uh, with trying to get the things that you're working on, some, some amazing... Uh, ideas and uh, obviously you guys have already thought about it so thank you thank, and, you. Uh, thank you yeah we're gonna wrap up and if you're interested in seeing my design talk which is kind of about product design it's tomorrow um, afternoon okay yeah for just some ideas four ways to design more sustainably <laughs> all right thank you so much thank, thank you, you.